Malcolm Miller's last few months encompassed several key moments. It was so much more than just one last voyage. The SDA office had informed us that our departure from Aberdeen should be low key. However, this did not sit right with those of us on board. We called into Aberdeen in August 1999 at the end of the tall ships race from Lowick to Olberg. Malcolm Miller meant a great deal to the people of Aberdeen, stemming from her build there in 1967. Prior to our arrival, I'd been in touch with Ian Fenwick, stalwart of Aberdeen STA. He brought down Peter Fisher, one of the early volunteers who had sailed annually as a doctor, and they wanted to organise something to mark the departure of Malcolm Miller on her last sailing from the port where she was built. I too felt this would say a proper goodbye to the city, as so many people who helped in her construction and in her early days were still alive. From the small beginnings, we ended up with an impressive departure. Peter Fisher presented me with a beautiful paying off or decommissioning pennant. It was a 32 foot long Scottish saltire, one foot for every year the Malcolm Miller had been in service. Made from a silk like material, it flew majestically from the mizzen mast head. Apparently, it should be flown from the main mast, but I was concerned that it would catch on the traffic stays and rip. I was so proud of this pennant that I flew it every possible occasion during the ensuing port visits. Ian Fenwick organised an evening event on joining day, inviting Lord Provost, plus a number of people who had been involved in the building of Malcolm Miller. This included a shipwright, together with some of the yard workers from the build, plus a number of volunteers who had been on for the engine and sailing trials, followed by the delivery voyage to Leith. To these people it meant a huge amount that we were marking Malcolm Miller's final departure in this way. When our guests arrived, the sea cadets from T.S. Silla, together with our trainees, lined the quay. The Grampian Police Pipe Band, one of the best pipe bands in Scotland, played for half an hour, ending with beating the retreat at sunset. Our ensign was lowered by the sea cadets and our dressing flags were lowered almost in time by our brand new crew who had not even been on board for one day. A short but lively party on board the ensued with the Lord Provost, the band, the trainees and guests all joining in together. The following day we departed the harbour with Roy Malcolm as mate, Richard Priest as engineer and Sir Tyler as cook. Training continued for the trainees amongst the interviews with TV crews and the radio. Again, we were dressed overall, including the beautiful paying off pennant, which floated gently from the mizzen mast. We had a piper on board, plus five guests, and the other live boat followed us out. I gave helm orders by sign to a brand new trainee who had never steered before. Due to the piper playing, I knew the helm might have trouble hearing helm orders, so I'd already explained that my left hand out with five fingers was port five, etc. We left with the minimum speed needed to maintain good steerage, so as to savour the moment for a little longer. Leaving Aberdeen was the best farewell we could ever expect. The captain of the PO Scottish Ferry St Clair, who I knew from my days there, sounded their whistle. Likewise, all the supply boats stood alongside in the harbour, blowing their whistles whilst the crew stood on deck cheering. One supply boat even had a piper playing, so they got a huge cheer from our crew. I felt a huge sense of pride and also sorrow that this ship, which meant so much to the Abedonians, would not be returning. The Abedonians came out to express their sentiments and cheer from the piers, including a large group of workers from the shipyard. After clearing the pier heads, I called Aberdeen Harbour saying, thanks for that superb send-off, to which they replied, Yes, it was some departure. The piper and guests left by the RNLI boat and we commenced setting sail. As soon as we had enough canvas set, the engines were turned off. For the first time in three days, we experienced peace. The superb send-off was from the very heart and soul of Aberdeen and none of the permanent crew could imagine there'd be a better send-off anywhere else. It was a moving experience and though the trainees realised it was an important occasion, it did not fully reach into their hearts 
like it did to the permanent crew and afterguard. As Richard Priestley, engineer, commented, it was a real lump in your throat time. Another port which gave us a special send off was St. Marlow. And that was during the last voyage, the last youth voyage at the end of October. Roy Love as mate, with Lester Simpson as relief bosun. Alan was the engineer and Sue Tyler the cook. Lester is an extremely talented and accomplished musician and he played the pipes really well. Philippe Rousseau, our friend in St Marlowe, joined us in the lock on arrival, informing us that the city wanted to honour the occasion by hosting a reception on board. The next morning the crew worked hard to get the ship looking smart. The ship was dressed overall with a paying off pennant once more flying beautifully. At lunchtime, around 30 dignitaries arrived, including two deputy mayors, port officials and some pilots from the port. Two pipers played the Breton pipes and they later teamed up with Lester, our bosun, to continue playing. They were amazed that Lester could play Breton tunes. The deputy mayor made a speech saying that they felt that St Marlow was Malcolm Miller's second home port and they calculated that she had visited St Marlo about 200 times during her life and that the schooners had visited many more times than any other tall ships. They went out of their way to emphasise just how much Malcolm Miller meant to St Marlo. After the reception, Lord Nelson arrived, so we formed a welcoming committee on the quayside, which included Lester once again playing the pipes. After Lord Nelson was all secure alongside, we had an intership tug of war, and on the third tug, just about all the crew from both ships joined in pulling. Though I think there was some cheating going on from their crew in wheelchairs. And in the evening, the crew from both ships went ashore together. On our departure from St Marlo, we left the berth to the lock, yards manned, dressed overall. Lester playing the pipes, the paying off pennant flying, and the saluting cannon roaring. With the wind a helpful southerly, we set sail and followed the buoy channel under sail power alone. The TV crew shot some excellent footage from Philippe's boat. Our final voyage included St Peterport Guernsey to Weymouth via Cherbourg. Yet again, I had word from the SDA to keep the trip quiet. By now, the more regular permanent crew were on board with Mark killing back as mate, Alan as engineer, Ken Gates Boson came out of retirement for the voyage, and Kate O'Leary was on as cook. We all felt something special about the voyage, but it never had a final voyage atmosphere. Many real characters have sailed on these ships and anecdotes are numerous. There was a lovely comment about Alan Brooks, one that rightly he was very proud of. One of the female trainees said, I'd have loved to have had you as my grandfather. He fits that role to a T. I always remember Alan explaining to the trainees about the vacuum heads, saying the vacuum was strong enough to suck an egg out of a chicken. Ray Duffett was cook's assistant and a great fun guy. He played his bagpipes throughout the last voyage. He had made these pipes himself using old banisters. The bag was covered in tartan cloth, concealing a plastic pink flamingo, inside of which was a cassette recorder with speakers. From a distance, most people thought he was really playing. Unfortunately, so few of the voyage crew had sailed before, they didn't understand just what it meant to be Malcolm Miller's final voyage. And the voyage didn't have a last minute atmosphere. People like Ron Cunningham were on board who gave so much to the STA, and he was one of many to do so. Alan Brooks told me he felt his home had been sold from underneath him as he'd worked on her for the last 15 years. We sailed from St Peterport at lunchtime with Channel TV and BBC Guernsey filming. The paying off pennant was flying. Ray Duffett was on his pipes, aka Sweezy Flamingo. The cannon was firing and Kate was driving the rib. When she went to pick the linesman up, she caught the front of the rib on something sharp and it popped with a bang. Kate told the crew that the cannon had fired at them, causing the puncture. Some even believed her because that was how it appeared on the track chart. 
under the square sail course and rapide, we shot through the Aldemy race to arrive in the Grand Grade of Cherbourg late at night. We anchored there before going alongside the following morning, but we only had the day in as we had to leave at 10 o'clock at night to make our planned arrival for 1500 the following day in Weymouth. The southerly wind was to be strong overnight, but falling away quickly by morning, so I didn't want to risk not arriving on time. The port authorities in Cherbourg knew it was our last visit, so they came down to wish us well. The crew were kept busy as we sailed off the berth without the need of engines. Again, it was a square sail run. I could hardly believe our good fortune. At first, the speed was low as the wind hadn't picked up. During the early hours, we were creaming along mid-channel. I got up at three o'clock in the morning as we were rolling with quarter seas and an uncomfortable motion. By breakfast, the wind had eased, but the motion had not improved and many crew were seasick. The plan was to have a final, final, super happy hour, but no one felt the cleaning up would be up to much. So we continued to Weymouth Bay for shelter and then actually anchored in Portland Bay for a couple of hours. So the crew could face their lunch and we could get sorted out. As we passed through Weymouth Pier Heads, our office staff were waving and Nick Sargent set off a sequence of fireworks. I came in slowly and brought the ship along nicely. The yards were manned despite it being blustery. And of course we had my paying off pennant flying. After we were tied up, Bob Lamro presented me with a bottle of champagne. That evening, Sue cooked the Christmas-style dinner. I sat down in the half-deck, and the crew member who sat across from me said, My wife bought me this voyage as a 55th birthday present, saying I had to keep a diary. When you came and did your first talk to us, I wrote, The captain is a lady. And I could think of no way, other way of finishing off than by writing, The captain is still a lady. I was touched. After dinner, all the crew went to the RFA, RAFA club for the evening. Mark, Sim, Kate and Bob Lambert were in the morning, so quick one first. I asked Cathy, the medic, to help me wear the paying off pennant. We wrapped it round and round, and it looked quite stunning, or so I thought, though I was slightly dubious about wearing it. We'd made it a little too tight around the knees and calves so I could barely walk. Climbing over the bulwarks was not easy, and I had to pull my weight up by putting on the braces to clear the bulwarks, as we didn't have a gangway rig. Arriving at the moorings in my damp fellow waterproofs, I said to the permanent crew, Just what does every well-dressed lady have under her damn fellows? And then I removed the jacket. After that, I went to the RAFA club, where my dress went down very well indeed with the voyage crew. All I used to hold it up was one safety pin and the flag lanyard itself. Several crew even refused to believe that this was the very same flag that we had been flying during the voyage. All 32 feet of it browned me. The voyage had gone off very well with great sailing, much of it downwind, which was more than you could ever hope for in November. And there was a great bunch of crew to enjoy it. Malcolm Miller's farewell started in style in Aberdeen and continued until her, till her final port of Weymouth. She is missed and remembered by many.